Okay, so I have uh, some context that I'm going to want to give you um, in a moment. But before we sort of go to that, uh, does anybody have any questions or observations they want to make about the first 100 pages of this? Anything that has particularly interested or confused you? Kian is a kind of comically disgusting character, yeah. But he is also kind of a kind of a vicious caricature um, of a native official um, in British Imperial India. Now, prior to uh, probably the early 20th century, uh, officials like Upo Kin probably wouldn't have existed in British India. Um, there were, well, there was actually one major thing that happened in the 19-teens that really kind of changed the way uh, British India was run. Can anybody guess? Was it the revolt we talked about last time? Well, the, the revolt did institute some serious social changes, right? Um, for example, there the, the was after that revolt in 1857 that British women started coming out to India uh, to marry British men, uh, Anglo-Indian men. And so we have a distinction there between right, the Sahib, and you'll also see this word pop up in the novel quite a bit, Mem Sahib, right? Mem Sahib essentially means right, woman Sahib, right? And the code by which the Mem Sahib lives is a little bit different than the code by which the Sahib lives. We'll talk about the Sahib code a little bit in a moment uh, because it's actually really important to understanding what go, what, the way people behave um, in the novel. But there was another, like a major world historical event in the 19 teens that really kind of upset British imperial administration. Caused enormous loss of manpower. <laughs> so try, try, try to think the most obvious big historical event from the 19 teens. Precisely, yes. <laughs> they're like, they're like, yeah, they're like, they're like, there's no ways this obvious. It really is that obvious. Yes, it really is that obvious. Um, so. Nearly a whole generation of young British men was you know, killed or damaged, um, you know, psychologically, physically, um, in this war. So, what this meant that, like, on the one hand, the British Empire had stretched by the 1920s to its largest point, right? It was as big as it was going to get, but they didn't have nearly as many traditionally educated and trained British men to run it because they were either dead or needed at home. So a number of changes were instituted. For one thing, um, in 1919, Parliament passed the Government of India Act. And now when I'm talking, you know, I know I'm talking about India here, but one thing that we need to remember is that administratively, Burma, which we see over here, was part of British India. Right? It was administered as part of the part of that province, right? So the Government of India Act Native Indians were granted limited representation in government. 
and they were permitted to take upper level jobs in the imperial bureaucracy. So someone like Upo Kin can become a local magistrate. Someone like Dr. Veraswamy can become you know, the chief prison official, right? This was something that really wouldn't have happened much before 1919. However, in Burma in particular, this caused a lot of unrest, in part because Burma was excluded from the government of India Act until 1923. So a good deal of resentment towards the British uh, built up in that time. Now, the 1919 Government of India Act was actually also passed in response to uh, one of the great British military mistakes of the era. Um, okay, you know, mistake is maybe too weak a word. Let's, let's just go with atrocity. Um, earlier in that year, in 1919, oh, none of these markers are any really good. This one's worse. Let's try green. Hey, there we go. In 1919, uh, in uh, the city of Amritsar, which is both the, uh, it's the major city in um, the Indian portion, not the Pakistani portion of the Punjab region, and it is also uh, the holy city uh, for uh, the Sikh religion. Uh, so in April of 1919, a group of Sikh pilgrims uh, came to uh, Amritsar for a traditional festival, uh, which, well, the, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The city happened to have been placed by the British under martial law because of a series of nonviolent protests against British rule. So these pilgrims show up. They didn't realize they were breaking any kind of curfew. They didn't know the city was under martial law. And so uh, the <coughs> British military official in charge, a guy by the name of Colonel Dyer, D-Y-E-R, um, had his men open fire with machine guns on them. So this Amritsar massacre led to some of these relatively tepid reforms later in the year as a way for the British government to sort of save face, right? Now we see this actually directly referenced in the novel. Um, there's a portion of where the, the people are talking at the club. Uh, let's see. I've written Flory is a hypocrite in this so many times. All right, on page 32. They're talking about the ruin of the empire. Right. Our Burra Sahib at Mandalay always said, put in Mrs. Lackerstein, that in the end we shall simply leave India. Young men will not come out here any longer to work all their lives for insults and ingratitude. We shall just go. When the natives come to us begging us to stay, we shall say, no, you have had your chance, you wouldn't take it. Very well, we shall leave you to govern yourselves. And then what a lesson that will teach them. It's all this law and order that's done for us at Westfield gloomily. The ruin of the Indian Empire through too much legality was a recurrent theme was full with Westfield. Right, Westfield is the police commissioner. So too much legality is the problem he complains about here. So just, we'll delve into the irony of that in a moment. According to him, nothing save a full-sized rebellion and the consequent reign of martial law could save the empire from decay. All this paper-chewing and chit-passing, 
Office baboos are the real ruler of this country now. Our number's up. Best thing we can do is just shut up our shop and let them stew in their own juice. I don't agree. I simply don't agree, Ellis said. We could put things right in a month if we chose. It only needs a penny worth of pluck. Look at Amritsar. Look at how they cave in after that. Dyer knew the stuff to give them. Poor old Dyer. That was a dirty job. Those cowards in England have got something to answer for. Now, Ellis is established fairly early as the most racist member of the club, right? right? Ellis, from the very beginning, is opposed to the admittance of native members into the club. Um, he's suspicious of Flory for Flory's friendship with Dr. Veraswamy. Um, and he is here saying that, you know, Dyer was right to shoot those people and that the only thing that is going to <clears throat> uh, sort of uh, maintain British authority in India is continued violence and repression, right? There was a kind of sigh from the others, the same sigh that a gathering of Roman Catholics will give at the mention of Bloody Mary. Even Mr. McGregor, who detested bloodshed and martial law, shook his head at the name of Dyer. Ah, poor man, sacrificed to the Paget MPs. Well, perhaps they will discover their mistake when, when it is too late. So, <clears throat> does anybody remember um, this term? Oh, it's even still sort of embedded at the board here where I wrote it. That we talked a little bit about last time, the Pukka Sahib. Is this familiar to anybody? Does anybody remember from when we talked about Kipling? What, a, what the Pukka Sahib was? Isn't it something like master? Something? Yeah, Sahib means master, right? Or gentleman. It sort of comes to mean something like gentleman. And it's a term that is generally used in imperial lingo to refer to white people in India, right? Sahib, right? Male, per, male white person, Sahib. Female white person, Mem Sahib. The Pukka Sahib, right? Pukka Sahib means something like absolute gentleman. And it has to do not so much with your skin color, although only a white person would qualify for this particular title, but with the way you comport yourself. So Pukka Sahib refers to a particular kind of white person. So somebody, for example, who would come from a public school background. Now, does everybody understand uh, what the distinction is between an American public school and a British public school. What does public school mean in Britain? Does it actually mean a school to which the public is admitted? It's like a primary school, right? It's not a primary school, although there are public schools that are sort of, they're, they're, they're called, uh, um, <clears throat> they're, they're called primary colleges, yeah, but, um, a public school in Britain is a private boarding school. Why they call them public schools, I'm really not entirely sure. But yeah, they're not schools that are open to all taxpayers or the, 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 to, the, to the entire public like an American public school is, right? A British public school is typically, particularly the elite ones like uh, Eton and Winchester and Marlborough, right? These are where the children of the elite are educated. It kind of reminds me of the, what is the portrait of an artist as a young man. That's yeah. What you guys do in that. Yeah, the school he starts out at, Clongos, right, and then Belvedere College. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, I mean those are Catholic, those are Catholic Jesuit mm -hmm. schools, but they're built on the same sort of model. Yeah, you, they're, it's, it's a fee pay. You, you pay a fee to attend a pri you know, the, what we would call a private boarding school. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, but it is the same sort of, I mean, hell, even like, uh, you know, how many of you have read Harry Potter? Right, Hogwarts is based on that kind of 
British public school model. It's even sort of divided into those four little colleges, right, that compete with each other. So, <clears throat> right, I had some notes on this. Okay, so the public schools are where the children of the elite were typically educated, um, and they stressed a couple of things, right? Meritocracy, right, the, the cream rises to the top. Exclusivity. You typically only got there if you were already a gentleman. Now, this didn't necessarily mean that you were an aristocrat. In the 19th century, these public schools are kind of where the rising middle class, the merchant bourgeoisie, and the old landed aristocracy came together. So what these public schools tended to teach uh, was, on the one hand, like a curriculum that was largely kind of based on the classics. Uh, so you'd be reading a lot of uh, Homer and Ovid and shit like that. Um, and Mostly what they were trying to instill in their students was a particular ethic. How many of you have seen those keep calm and carry on signs, right? You know, the, and we've heard of the idea like the British stiff upper lip, right? So that idea of stoicism, of sort of resignation to doing your duty, that's very much a part of this British public school ethic. Right, stoicism and duty, fair play and sportsmanship, chivalry, right, it's up to the strong to protect the weak, and a kind of disinterestedness. Now what I mean by this, is the idea that you're supposed to do your duty, whether it is in your personal interest, whether it's your personal benefit or not, right? You do your duty without concern for your personal gain, your personal welfare. So this is the public school ethic, right? And this is the ideal to which the Pukka Sahib, the absolute gentleman out in British India, is supposed to aspire. But what tends to happen is that this ethical code tends to get replaced by a kind of racial or tribal code, where what is important is not that you, you know, in order to be a Pukka Sahib, right, what is important is not that you adhere to the old code, but that you are an English person at all, right? The English people, for example, that we see in the club, all stick together, regardless of whether they think the others are right or not. We see this particularly in Flory's uh, non-committal attitudes towards his, like, he likes Dr. Veraswamy, right? Veraswamy is his friend. He doesn't like Ellis. He doesn't like Westfield. He doesn't like the Lackersteins, right? He thinks these people are assholes, and they are. But he won't stand up to them to support his friend, right? If we look on page 46, right, Flory is, uh, you know, he's visiting with Dr. Veraswamy. Veraswamy is telling him his troubles, right? But would anyone believe a fellow like that against you? He's only a low-down magistrate. You're a high official. Ah, uh, Mr. Flora, you do not understand oriental cunning. Upo Kien has ruined higher officials than I. He will know ways to make himself believed. And therefore, ah, uh, it's a difficult business. The doctor took a step or two up and down the veranda, polishing his glasses and his handkerchief. 
It was clear that there was something uh, more which delicacy prevented him from saying. For a moment, his manner was so troubled that Flory would have liked to ask whether he could help in some way, but he did not, for he knew the uselessness of interfering in Oriental quarrels. No European ever gets to the bottom of these quarrels. There is always something impervious to the European mind, a conspiracy behind the conspiracy, a plot within the plot. Besides, to keep out of native quarrels is one of the ten precepts of the Pukka Sahib. He said doubtfully, what is a difficult business? It is, if only, ah, my friend, you will laugh at me, I fear. But it is this, if only I were a member of your European club, if only, how different would my position be? The club, how would that help you? My friend, in these matters, prestige is everything. It is not that Upo Kien will attack me openly. He would never dare. It is that he will libel me and backbite me. And whether he is believed or not depends entirely upon my standing with the Europeans. It is so that things happen in India. If our prestige is good, we rise. If bad, we fall. A nod and a wink will accomplish more than a thousand official reports. And you do not know what prestige it gives to an Indian to be a member of the European club. In the club, practically, he is a European. No calumny can touch him. A club member is sacrosanct. Flory looked away over the veranda rail. He had got up as though to go. It always made him ashamed and uncomfortable when it had to be admitted between him the doctor, because of his black skin, could not be received in the club. It is a disagreeable thing when one's close friend is not one's social equal, but is a thing native to the very air of India. They might elect you at the next journal meeting, he said. I don't say they will, but it's not impossible. So why won't he just commit to helping his friend get into the club? Right? The, the top British official in the town has already said, like, look, like we are the last European club in Burma that has not admitted any native members. We need to get on this. But Flory won't bother to step up to help his friend, right? Why won't he do that? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Who's it going to make him fight with? Ellis and. Yeah. That he's the one that's the worst. Yeah, Ellis is. Um, yeah, the, the mo yeah, Ellis is the, yeah, the most openly racist. And I think it might also be worth talking about the membership of the club here a little bit, right? So when we talk about this Puka Sahib public school ethic, right? We're talking about people who are supposed to be drawn from the elite ranks of society. Now, if we look at the European club in Kyoktada, how elite do these people seem to be? Chapter 2. Right, Flory comes to the club. And the first person he runs into is Westfield, the police commissioner, right? Who just who just wants to kill people. Right? Please just give him his chance to kill somebody. told of him, on the club steps, a sandy-haired Englishman with a prickly mustache, pale gray eyes too far apart, and abnormally thin calves to his legs, was standing with his hands, with his hands in the pockets of his shorts. This was Mr. Westfield, the district superintendent of police. With a very bored air, he was rocking himself backwards and forwards on his heels, and pouting his upper lip so that his mustache tickled his nose. He greeted Flory with a slight sideways movement of his head. His way of speaking was clipped and soldierly, missing out nearly every word that well could be missed out. Nearly everything he said was intended for a joke, but the tone of his voice was hollow and melancholy. How impressive a specimen of Englishness does Westfield seem to be? With his abnormally thin calves and his eyes too far apart and his failure at jokes. Pretty weak tea, right? 
And then, right, we have Ellis, who is a timber merchant like Flory. If you look on page 21, right? Oh, leave that drunken sot alone, said Ellis without turning around. He had a spiteful cockney voice. What's a co do you guys know what a Cockney accent is? Or what a Cockney is? I know what it sounds like, but uh... <laughs> the apples and pears, Governor, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's like a thick working class London accent, right? Not a high class or high prestige accent. So Ellis's accent, which he tends to, you know, um, to emphasize hints at humble class origins, right? But what about Lackerstein? He's just been drunk. Yeah. With a wife that follows him around because he can't stop cheating on him. <laughs> yeah, he's a drunk, he's a drunk and a philanderer, right? His wife is a harpy. Mrs. Lackerstein is suspicious and unpleasant. And then there's the other guy, Maxwell, the youngest guy, right, who just sits in a chair and never says anything. And Flory, who is regarded by the others as a ball sheet. Do you know what they mean when they call him a ball sheet, by the way? What ball she is supposed to be short for? Okay, ball she is a British slang for Bolshevik. And when they call Flory a ball she, what they mean to imply is that he's a communist, right? Now, they're using it kind of the way a lot of Americans will use communist or socialist as a slur on somebody, right? Um, Anybody whose opinion is to the left of theirs is, is clearly you know, a bullshit or a communist, right? Not a patriot. So they regard Flory as a bullshit, but he is a pretty weak livered and weak willed bullshit, right? So <clears throat> nothing about this club or these people seems particularly appealing, right? I mean, I wouldn't want to hang out with these assholes. <laughs> And the club itself, if we look on page 20, right, they went in, Westfield remarking in his gloomy voice, lead on Macduff, right? That's his repeated catchphrase, or he's this constant short quote from, from Shakespeare. Inside, the club was a teak-walled place smelling of earth oil and consisting of only four rooms, one of which contained a forlorn library of 500 mildewed novels and another an old and mangy billiard table. This, however, seldom used, for during most of the year hordes of flying beetles came buzzing around the lamps and littered themselves over the cloth. There were also a card room and a lounge, which looked towards the river over a wide veranda. But at this time of day, all the verandas were curtained with green bamboo chicks. The lounge was an unhomelike room with coconut matting on the floor and wicker chairs and tables which were littered with shiny illustrated papers. For ornament, there were a number of bonzo pictures and the dusty skulls of Samber. A punka, lazily flapping, shook dust into the tepid air. Do you guys know what a punka is? I realize that like there are no footnotes in this edition and that some of the terminology is probably unfamiliar. So a punka is, um, it's a kind of like automated fan system, right? It would be like a bunch of like great big flapping fans that are on a belt. And they're operated by a guy who pulls the belt, right? So it's called a punka wall, a punka fellow. Um, so, yeah, they have to be operated by hand. 
So this is a pretty desultory and disgusting little place, right? It's not like there's too much to do there. The company's unpleasant. And yet, Veraswamy and Upo Kin both want to become members. Now, why do they want to join this little club? What benefit would accrue to them? The people and maybe the things that I don't know. Well, yeah, for for Vera Swami, Vera Swami actually has a practical reason yeah, to want to join the club, the people, right? Yeah. Is mm -hmm. one, I guess. Yeah, Upo Kien is publishing slanders about him. And if he's seen to be friends with the Europeans, he thinks this will protect him from Upo Kien's slanders. Now, for Upo Kien, the whole point is just social advancement, right? Mm -hmm. This is the next step for this guy. We actually have a pretty interesting sort of rehearsal of Upo Kien's. Um, career in chapter one. Right, if we look actually at the first page, right, page five, right, it had been a brilliantly successful life. Upo Kien's earliest memory back in the 80s was of standing a naked pot-bellied child watching the British troops march victorious into Mandalay. He remembered the terror he had felt of those columns of great beef-fed men, red-faced and red-coated and the long rifles over their shoulders, and the heavy rhythmic tramp of their boots. He had taken to his heels after watching them for a few minutes. In his childish way, he had grasped that his own people were no match for this race of giants. To fight on the side of the British, to become a parasite upon them, had been his ruling ambition, even as a child. At 17, he had tried for a government appointment, but he had failed to get it, being poor and friendless, and for three years he had worked in the stinking labyrinth of the Mandalay bazaars, clerking for the rice merchants and sometimes stealing. Then when he was 20, a lucky stroke of blackmail put him in possession of 400 rupees, and he went at once to Rangoon and bought his way into a government clerkship. The job was a lucrative one, though the salary was small. At that time, a ring of clerks were making a steady income by misappropriating government stores, and Po Kien, he was playing Po Kien then, the honorific U came years later, took naturally to this kind of thing. However, he had too much talent to spend his life in a clerkship, stealing miserably in Annas and Pise. One day, he discovered that the government, being short of minor officials, were going to make some appointments from among the clerks. The news would have become public in another week, but it was one of Po Kien's qualities that his information was always a week ahead of everyone else's. He saw his chance and denounced all his confederates before they could take alarm. Most of them were sent to prison, and Po Kien was made an assistant township officer as the reward of his honesty. Since then, he had risen steadily. Now, at 56, he was a subdivisional magistrate, and he would probably be promoted still further and made an acting deputy commissioner with Englishmen as his equals and even his subordinates. So, it might help if we think of this in terms proposed by the Tunisian psychoanalyst and theorist Albert Mimi. Uh, Mimi wrote a book called The Colonizer and the Colonized. And in this book, Mami sort of breaks down the sorts of people living in an imperial colony into three groups. There are colonizers, there are colonials, and there are the colonized. The colonizers are those from the imperial power who um, completely accept imperialism, who are completely okay with their role in the colonial system, and who take full advantage 
of the advantages the system gives them, right? Right. The colonizer is openly colonialist, right? fully believes in his superiority over the colonized, right? The colonized being whoever the indigenous or pre-existing population would be. Now the colonial, this kind of in-between figure, is someone who comes from the colonizer culture but is not comfortable with the practices of imperialism, right? Who sympathizes with the colonized, um, who believes that the practices of the colonizer need to be mitigated um, or abandoned altogether. So the colonial would be sort of the sympathetic colonist. I think, you know, we could probably if we look at the novel, we can place characters pretty easily into these three groups, right? Colonizer characters would include people like Ellis and Westfield. Colonized characters would include Lupo Kin and Dr. Varaswamy. We'll talk in a minute about sort of the way the knees sort of divides between different kinds of colonized. And the colonial, in this case, would be Flory. Now, Flory actually pretty accurately represents Mamie's picture of the colonial because um, there's a chapter of the book in which Mamie openly questions whether colonials actually exist. Because he says he sees plenty of people who claim to sympathize with the plight of the colonized. Plenty of people who say the system is unfair, who say the system is unjust, but who still pursue their own advantages within it, right? They don't give up any of the advantages that the system gives them in order to sort of put their money where their mouth is, right? So they'll say, oh yeah, that's a terrible shame but then they won't actually do anything to change things, right? So Flory is exactly that kind of person, right? The colonial who doesn't exist, right? He has friends who are natives, but he's also an exploiter, right? And we should probably talk a little bit about his relationship with Mahlame whom he refers to as his mistress, but what does she call herself? Does she see her position as just that of a mistress? Yeah, she refers to herself as his wife, right? Mm -hmm. If we allow, uh, yeah, you know, let's actually just go there while I'm thinking of it so that I don't lose this thread. Page 52. Right, as Kosla left the room, there was a scraping of sandals outside, and a Burmese girl's high-pitched voice said, Is my master awake? Come in, said Flory rather bad-temperedly. Madla May came in, kicking off red lacquered sandals in the doorway. She was allowed to come to tea as a special privilege, but not to other meals, nor to wear her sandals in her master's presence. Mahla May was a woman of 22 or 3, and perhaps 5 feet tall. She was dressed in a long yi of pale blue embroidered Chinese satin, and a starched white muslin, muslin ying yi, which, on which several gold lockets hung. Her hair was coiled in a tight black cylinder like ebony, and decorated with jasmine flowers. Her tiny, straight, slender body was as contourless as a bas-relief carved upon a tree, 
She was like a doll, with her oval still face the color of new copper and her narrow eyes, an outlandish doll and yet a grotesquely beautiful one. A scent of sandalwood and coconut oil came into the room with her. So one thing that strikes me is that there is there's really something racist in this description, right? What qualities of Mahlame is Orwell stressing? Particularly if you use a phrase like grotesquely beautiful. If we think about this as well in that sort of future passage where Elizabeth Lackerstein can't tell whether Mahalame is a man or a woman, what's being emphasized here in terms of the way her scent is described, in terms of the way her appearance is described? Well, it's like compared to things that like, aren't really human traits. Yeah, just describe in terms of objects, right? Yeah. Describe as being like a doll, for one thing. I mean, and in a way, like Flory does, treat her like an unwanted plaything. But also, um, the idea here, what's stressed, is her otherness, right? Her difference. And you know, no one, or very few people anyway in the novel, right, are described as being very attractive. But there is a particular ugliness in the way Orwell often describes uh, the Burmese, right? You have the grotesquely fat Upo Kin, whose uh, lips, are, lips and teeth are stained red um, from chewing on beetle nuts. Um, and in fact, it often, you know, the way it's, that's described often looks like he has a mouthful of blood, right? Like a vampire with little sharp white teeth um, chewing on. Uh, but yeah, Mahlame is described in similar sorts of terms of being other or alien, right? Being, like, her difference from Flory is what's stressed here. Mahlame came across to the bed sat down on the edge and put her arms rather abruptly around Flory. She smelled at his cheek with her flat nose in the Burmese fashion. Why did my master not send for me this afternoon, she said. I was sleeping. It is too hot for that kind of thing. So you would rather sleep alone than with Mahalame. How ugly you must think me then. Am I ugly, master? Go away, he said, pushing her back. I don't want you at this time of day. At least touch me with your lips then. There is no Burmese word for to kiss. All white men do that to your women. There you are then. Now leave me alone. Fetch some cigarettes and give me one. Why is it nowadays you never want to make love to me? Uh, two years ago it was so different. You loved me in those days and gave me presents of gold bangles and silk longies from Mandalay. And now look, Mahlame held out one tiny muslin clad arm, not a single bangle. Last month I had 30 and now all of them are pawned. How can I go to the bazaar without my bangles and wearing the same longi over and over again? I am ashamed before the other women. It is, is it my fault if you pawn your bangles? Two years ago, you would have redeemed them for me. Ah, you do not love Mahlame any longer. So, is there something else that's really kind of ugly in the way she's being portrayed? Like she's trying to get like money from him, basically. Yeah. Like, it's, sex. Yeah, that you know, she's sort of being depicted here as very kind of mercenary, right? That she just wants what she can get out of this white guy, but. The relationship is complicated in other ways as well. How did, how did he get her? Is this, you know, someone that he, you know, that he wooed? Or that he, uh, you know, hey, you know, you know, you know, you know asked out on a date or even, you know, made any sort of, you know, honorable arrangement with? He bought her from her parents, yeah. She's a possession. She belongs to him. Right. She put her arms around him and kissed him, a European habit which he had taught her. A mingled scent of sandalwood, garlic, coconut oil, and jasmine and hair floated from her. It was a scent that always made his teeth tingle. 
Rather abstractedly, he pressed her head back upon the pillow and looked down at her queer, youthful face with its high cheekbones, stretched eyelids, and short, shapely lips, again, stressing her difference, right, the difference in her appearance from his. She had rather nice teeth like the teeth of a kitten. He had bought her from her parents two years ago for 300 rupees. Yeah. She was a purchase. Right. She's a toy or a pet to him, not a person. And indeed, how does he treat her once Elizabeth Lackerstein shows up? Uh, he rescues Elizabeth from the actually harmless water buffalo, brings Elizabeth into her house, and it was in his house. Mahla May shows up. Elizabeth doesn't know whether Mahla May is a man or a woman. Look on page 87. Right. Mala May came forward with her hand on her hip. She had come from within the house with a calm air that asserted her right to be there. The two girls stood face to face, less than six feet apart. No contrast could have been stranger. The one faintly colored as an apple blossom, the other dark and garish, with a gleam almost metallic on her cylinder of ebony hair and the salmon pink silk of her long yi. Flory thought he had never noticed before how dark Mahlame's face was and how outland and now out how outlandish her tiny stiff body, straight as a, a, sh a soldier's, with not a curve in it except the vase-like curve of her hips. He stood against the veranda rail and watched the two girls, quite disregarded. For the best part of a minute, neither of them could take her eyes from the other. But which found the spectacle more grotesque, more incredible, there is no saying. Mahla May turned her face to round to Flory with her black brows, thin as pencil lines drawn together. Who is this woman, she demanded sullenly. He answered casually, as though giving or an order to a servant. Go away this instant. If you make any trouble, I will afterwards take a bamboo and beat you, uh, beat you until not one of your ribs is whole. Mahla May hesitated, shrugged her small shoulders, and disappeared. And the other, gazing after her, said curiously, was that a man or a woman? A woman, he said, one of the servants' wives, I believe. She had come to ask about the laundry, that was all. So an, a young English woman shows up. And then, what's his Burmese mistress doing? Just a servant. Just a servant, right? He even lies about the relationship, right? It's that code of the Pukka Sahib, right? English people sticking together. Europeans sticking together. Always siding with each other. And that's the thing that even sort of Flory's colonial rather than colonizer feelings can't override, right? This is why Flory is ultimately not as bullshy as the others think he is, right? He can't actually go over to the other side. He maintains racial or ethnic loyalty over any concerns of ethics, right? Now, as far as the, col the relationships of the colonized people to the colonizers in Mimi's scheme here is, right? Mimi outlines basically three ways colonized people deal with a colonizing presence. The first Right. Act of resistance. Right. Agitating, whether peacefully or violently, to get the colonizer to go the hell home and go back to his own country. The second is more like sort of acquiescence. 
right? You don't really like it. You'd probably rather they not be there, but you're going to put up with it and get what you can out of it. And the third is, uh, what's, what's the word I want to use for this? Um, active collaboration. Right. Not only do you accept the presence of the colonizer, but you actively help him, whether for reasons of ideology or to advance your own interest in some way, right? So Dr. Viraswamy would fall into this third category of collaborators, right? He thinks that the British presence in India is a good thing and sort of defends the British to Flory. We see um, on page 37 the doctor's reading material, right? It's collections of morally improving essays by people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thomas Carlyle. And then when Flory starts bashing the club, right? Ah, doctor, said Flory, supine in the long chair. What a joy to be here after that bloody club. When I come to your house, I feel like a nonconformist minister dodging up to town and going home with a tart. Such a glorious holiday from them. He motioned with one heel in the direction of the club for my beloved fellow empire builders. British prestige, the white man's burden, the book of Sahib, sans pure, sans reproche, you know. Such a relief to be out of the stink of it for a while. My friend, my friend, now come, come please, this is outrageous. You must not say such things of honorable English gentlemen. You don't have to listen to the honorable Englishman talking, an honorable gentleman talking doctor. I stood it as long as I could this morning. Ellis with his dirty N-word. Westfield with his jokes. McGregor with his Latin tags and please give the bearer 15 lashes. But when they got onto that story about the old Havildar, you know, the dear old Havildar had said that the British left India, there wouldn't be a rupee or a virgin between, you know. Well, I just couldn't stand it any longer. It's time that old Havildar was put on the retired list. He's been saying the same thing ever since the Jubilee in 87. The doctor grew agitated as he always did when Flory criticized the club members. He was standing with his plump white clad behind, balanced against the veranda rail, and sometimes gesticulating. When searching for a word, he would nip his black thumb and forefinger together as if a capture an idea floating in the air. But truly, truly, Mr. Flory, you must not speak so. Why is it that always you are abusing the Pukka Sahibs, as you call them? They are the salt of the earth. Consider the great things they have done. Consider the great administrators who have made British India what it is. Consider Clive, Warren Hastings, Dalhousie, Curson. They were such men, I quote your immortal Shakespeare, as, take them for all in all, we shall not look upon their light again. Right, so for a Swami is really up on British achievements, right? What he sees is British civilizing achievements. And Flory is constantly down on the nastiness of his own compatriots. So the doctor falls very much sort of into that collaborator, club, uh, collaborator category, right? Not only is he a high official, thanks to the British administration, he seems to genuinely believe that they are doing the right thing. Now there's one other thing I want to note here. Now were any of you at all confused by the fact that the novel constantly refers to Burmans as black or that Ellis uses the N-word so much? Okay, and the reason for this is that white and black are not actually stable racial and ethnic historical categories. Right? Whiteness and blackness have been redefined at many different points in history, like in a, you know, who qualifies and who doesn't, right? So during this particular period of British imperial administration, anybody who is not white is black. And in fact, you even see um, caricatures of Irish nationalists in British newspapers. 
in which they are given traditionally African features. So white, in this case, refers to English. Black refer, or you know, derogatory slurs that to them mean the same thing, refers to anyone who is not English. That's, what, that's how they mean these particular terms. They don't, they don't actually have anything to do with anyone's skin color. Okay, so, Upokin is more the kind of acquiescence model colonized, right? He could probably do without the British presence, but he knows that accepting it and working within it gives him a chance to move up and to use his own cunning to take advantages from these people, right? You know, he refers to himself, you know, quite honestly um, and admiringly as a parasite upon the British presence, right? It's the British presence that has allowed him to go from his humble origins as a poor village boy to a high official, but he has no particular love for the British, right? He just, he likes what he can get out of them. And we haven't yet met anyone who really meets the resistance model, but one thing I will tell you is to pay attention to the way the Burmese schoolboys behave. The way the children who are being educated in the school system set up by the British act towards British officials. And then you, you, you'll see there the resistant colonized. In fact, and we've, got, we've had references here too school children. Um, let's see, where, where, where? Right, page 10. And you say that your little apprentice clerk, Clapé, wrote this article all by himself? Right. The article appears right in a nationalist publication called The Burmese Patriot. That is a very clever boy, a most promising boy. Never tell me again that these government high schools are a waste of time. Flappé shall certainly have his clerkship. So what these boys are learning in the government high school are the skills that they will then use to undermine the British regime, right? This boy has written this nasty libel on Mr. McGregor, the chief administrator. Now the other thing to note about Upo Kin, right, is that Upo Kin succeeds mostly by controlling discourse through storytelling, through narrative. Right? by always having the winning version of a particular story, right? He's moved himself up by ratting out his compatriots, right? He tells a story in which they're guilty and he's innocent. He is advancing his own position relative to the Europeans by making up stories about them and about Dr. Veraswamy, right? So he is in the shadows controlling everything that the Europeans believe about natives and most of what native Burmans believe about the Europeans, right? He's sitting in his court spreading stories. He's the one who influences what everyone else believes, right? For example, 
why does Ellis, well, who does Ellis believe spread those stories about Mr. McGregor? Who does he believe wrote that article that claimed uh, Mr. McGregor was running around fathering illegitimate children all over the place? for Flory that says all those nasty things about Veraswamy. Signed, a friend. And Ellis believes that Dr. Veraswamy wrote the piece in the Burmese Patriot, right? And this is why he insists on writing that notice to counter Mr. McGregor's notice that they won't have any natives in the club, which Flory then allows his name to be signed to. So Upo Kien is, like most of the Europeans aren't, don't even seem to be aware of his existence, right? They don't notice him, they don't know, Flory makes a point of saying to Dr. Veraswamy that he doesn't know who this guy is, he's not familiar with him. But he's the one who controls what everyone else thinks, right? Now the other thing to note as you read the rest of the novel, I want you to pay very close attention to our newly arrived Mem Sahib, right? I want you to watch Elizabeth Lackerstein. Think about first what is Flory's impression of her? Right? What ideas does he have in his head about this woman? And secondly, to what extent do these ideas have any basis in reality? And if he has constructed a kind of fantasy around this girl, right, what's the point? Why has he done so? What's led him to this? But yeah, by and large, what I want you to do as you continue here is think about this and think about how this code of the Pukka Sahib affects the way the Europeans interact with the Burmans throughout the novel and the way it kind of leads, um, well, the, the kind of blind spots that it creates for the European characters, right? All right, that's basically all I have for you today. Does anybody have any questions? Take your silence to be no. All right, then uh, continue on um, with the novel. We'll pick this back up on Thursday. Um, we'll see you then.